어, 오늘의 주제는 어, 과연 어, 게임 아이템 트레이딩 과연 우리의 미래인가 라는 주제로 <웃음> 네, 약간 그것이 알고 싶다 소닉이긴 한데요 로 오늘 패널 디스커션을 할 예정이고요 재미있는 질문들이 많이 있더라고요 어, 이번에 MC는 어, 영알못신 제가 MC를 하시는 게 아닌 여기 말콤이 직접 MC를 하실 예정이고요 어, 들으시면서 끝나고 난 후에 또 한번 퀘스천 할수 있으니까요 어, 하시고 나서 궁금한 거 있으면 여쭤보시면 될것 같습니다 네 그러면 Please. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, you guys know who I am, so I'm going to shut up and let some experts talk. Um, so, Jason, why don't you go first and, and tell, tell the audience a little bit about your background in video gaming. Okay. Uh, my name is Jason Jun. Uh, I'm an evangelist for NHN Entertainment. We're actually building, uh, working on our own gaming blockchain project. Um, my personal background is my whole career is in gaming. Uh, as a producer, game designer, entrepreneur, I've made mobile games. PC games, flash games. Um, so yeah, anything else? Okay. Go ahead. All right. yeah. Hi everyone, my name is Andrew Kim. Um, uh, my background is more of the VR. I happened to join Oculus uh, early enough to get some uh, VR experience and some good exit. Um, and been into China, uh, leading some uh, VR companies in China for the last two years. I recently joined Decentraland um, because uh, VR needed some help. There are a lot of hungry guys in the VR field, and I thought that Decentraland is the the platform that where its uh, next content could actually survive. So yeah, that's my background. Nice to meet you all. Yeah, well, I, well, one, I mean, f I thank both of you for, for joining us tonight. I, between the two of you, you probably bring, like, several decades of game experience. Um, I know it doesn't look like it, but, but, <laughs> but, I, could, but I could tell you guys have done a lot. Um, and, I, of course, know your backgrounds. So I think the first question that we wa I want to hear your opinion on is, you know, a lot of users who p spend a lot of time playing games feel like they own those items because they either spent money in the game or they put all this time and energy, they earned it. So, you know, as, as guys sitting on the other side who produce the games, how, what do you think about that point of view? So I, I don't play a whole lot of different MMO, but I spend too much time on um, COC and, you know, got Crash Royal way too much and spend quite a bit of money on it. But do I feel like I own it? Um, not necessarily. Did I invest it in it? Yes, I did a, invest a lot of money on it. Um, I think it started as though it is sort of um, features or function where I can achieve the next level rather than uh, owning that item myself or the uh, character myself. Uh, I think it's probably because uh, it didn't have that originality and the uniqueness, which I, be I believe in the um, non-fungible token, it is something that I only have and no one else has, and it's worthwhile keeping it. That's my experience. Um, I think generally, uh, as a hardcore gamer myself, I do feel that gamers do feel like they own the item, uh, mainly because that's, those are the rules presented to them in the game design, and that's what gamers are used to, right? So if I play Overwatch, and I own a skin for a certain character, you know, it's mine to use, it's mine to manipulate and customize my own, you know, my own characters. Um, I do have a, I think gamers generally do trust the game uh, publishers and designers. I don't think, you know, Blizzard or Valve, they're gonna take away my items just on a whim. I think there's generally some trust um, between gamers and the big game companies. Um, I do feel that generally they're, that ownership does exist in today's world, but now that uh, blockchain technology has come and has enabled things like NFTs and liquidity in marketplaces, I feel that ownership has evolved into something that feels more real and tangible. Um, but to answer your question, I do, I do think players do generally feel like they do own their items. Yeah. So if they own the items, if they feel like they own the items, um, let's take one step further. Um, should they have the ability to do whatever they want with them, like trade them or sell them or uh, modify them. What, 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 where do you think is like the boundary? Where does the limit end 
if if you accept that they feel like they own it, let's just assume that premise, how far would you, as a game designer, feel it's proper to allow them to go? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's really hard to say because um, it's, a, it's a very, it's a very, it really depends on the type of game, right? I mean, we're talking about games, we're talking about like CSGO and like World of Warcraft, but you know, the, the spectrum of games, you know, ranges much broader than that. Actually, the most prominent games are like casual games, like match three games, right? Um, I don't think what you're, th that question really applies to those type of games specifically. I think we're talking about more traditional hardcore games. Um, but I think it really, it's up to the game designer. I think the game designer or the, the game developer has really all the power to dictate the universe or the world and the rules of the game. Uh, now something like CryptoKitties, I feel like that game was designed around kind of the uh, interesting aspects of blockchain. And it was you know, designed to utilize, you know, um, and it was designed to utilize uh, you know, trade, tradability, liquidity. Um, I think that's what made the CryptoKitties interesting. But for traditional games like, let's say, Overwatch or World of Warcraft or PUBG, um, it's not really up to the players to decide. I think it's up to the game developers, right? And I think they want to do what's best to engage the gamers as much as possible. But on a theoretical standpoint, I think it's great to give more power to uh, players as long as the game balance is intact and keeps the engagement level high. Like I said, I don't think I feel like oh, I own it. <laughs> so, uh, it, because uh, I spend, let's say, $1,000 on a set of uh, characters and I cannot sell it. Um, it's not, it doesn't have the same value that I put it in. Uh, so, I mean, I put my time on it and my money on it to grow it, but I cannot sell it back and get back that, that time and money that I put on. So. Uh, eventually, I don't feel like I want it. You know. Well, here, here's the thing about, um, so we'll, we'll keep, keep the conversation going about this idea of, of secondary markets. I bring this up because I, I, I've heard this point of view that um, if, if there's a secondary market, so let's say you've put $1,000 into acquiring items and you're able to go sell it, and let's say you can get $500 or $700 back. Um, some people believe that money will probably go back into the game ecosystem. Maybe into the game you played, but probably back into games because you're a hardcore game, a gamer. Um, and that money came from somewhere else, right? It was somewhere else, out, someone else out there gave you that money and now you have that money to go spend. So do you think that that means that secondary uh, markets actually enhance the revenue or enhance the, the, the publisher's business? I mean, myself, I'm not a, so much a fan of a secondary market because I generally don't have a level of trust. Mm. So, um, and I don't, th I don't know the source of their uh, income and then where they belong. So that's generally, uh, that's how I feel. I don't think it goes back to the whole ecosystem mm. because there's um, some gap in there somewhere. Um, I think it really depends on the game. Um, if I, from a, and this is not from a gamer's perspective, this is from a, a game developer slash publisher's perspective. I feel like if they design the game around trading and enable trading within the game itself, I think they could capture all of the value. Um, but I think some game developers actually don't focus on that. Maybe uh, the CSGO developers, they, they focus on just the gameplay, right? And they allow other parties to do secondary markets and um, you know, create this <coughs> other trading platform because they feel like it brings engagement and brings um, <coughs> more engagement and more fun back into the into the game. Um, but to answer that question, I think it there isn't a yes or no answer to that because um, uh, we've seen instances where the question came up about like the Diablo Three Real Money uh, Auction House that was terrible for the game. That actually just ruined the gameplay, and it wasn't even about leveling up your character, it was about just manipulating the auction house and just, if you spend real money there, you just broke the game because there's no purpose into playing the game. So that was like a bad use of, you know, the game developer probably trying to capture all that value. Um, but I think um, it could be, I think it could actually be beneficial because I think trading by nature, P2P is fun and it's social um, just from that aspect. So I think it could, bring more engagement and fun back into the game, which makes 
the general gaming ecosystem better, and I think players just play the game longer. And yeah, yeah, we've observed that that people will stay engaged with the game when when trading happens because it stays relevant and it becomes a, like a meta game, like you said, it's very social. Um, so so let's talk a little bit about you know games have been creating virtual currencies for twenty years, right? We've been used to spending money and getting a virtual currency and spending it. So in a way, uh, you know, it seems like uh, we've prepared gamers for cryptocurrency, you know, mentally, right? It's a mental model they're used to. Um, but what do you think is missing uh, for like these for for tokens to work inside games, or or is it, is is it not necessary? I think gamers generally know <clears throat> the aspect of digital currency, right? Because all games have digital currencies. They understand there's this fake money that exists that's used to transact to buy game items or to participate in the game design. Um, so I do think gamers get it. It's just a currency, right? Um, I think for gamers to adopt the cryptocurrency specifically into their games, I think it has less, it has more to do with reducing friction and easing the onboarding, onboarding experience of cryptocurrency. Because um, I think blockchain technology itself is not something that you'd want to educate mainstream people. I, I don't think they really care about the technology aspect. Like, like most gamers don't care about what's the back end of whatever game they're playing, right? They just, want, they just care about the user experience. So as long as the onboarding experience and um, getting people to adopt cryptocurrency, I think they know how to use it, but getting them to adopt it and get their hands on it and being able to transact with it, I think that's the challenge. I, I completely agree. Yeah, onboarding experience sucks at this time. Um, so, but I, I think it's, um, uh, as Marco mentioned, the game is the place where the cryptocurrency will excel. And I think it's just a matter of time that we see some killer content and everybody will be drawn to it. Although onboarding experience will still be a challenge, but I think if there's a killer games on the market, I think it will ease the people's mind. So let's talk about the Korean market in particular. I mean, what, what things or consumer interests or trends do you see occurring here that uh, are different vis-a-vis -vis virtual currencies, cryptocurrency, and gaming? So I, don't, I got into a crypto field probably uh, six months ago, so um, not in that aspect that I can't really share too much, uh, but what we see is uh, Korean people as a culture. Um, yeah, I think right now it's just a boiling. Um, when we know this is something that actually we can make money off of it and then people enjoy it, I think there will be a surge of developers. And I can already see it that there are people that are very interested in developing uh, crypto games and getting this bandwagon. Um. Can you repeat the question one more time? Sorry. Yeah, I mean, just, just <laughs> oh, I'll, I'll project. Um, so I, I guess I was asking in, in the local market in Korea, what, what things do you see are different uh, with regards to using virtual currency and, and also the crypto market? OK. Um, so I'm Korean American. I'm not, I'm, I was born in America, so I, I'm, not re I'm not a real Korean but I live here, um, <clears throat> but here are my observations. I think Koreans are very homogenous people. Um, it's a very small country, it's a very dense country. I think trends, uh, if they pick up, they pick up quickly, right? Uh, you go outside Korea, I mean, I've noticed people are very, they're not, it's not as eclectic and diverse as, let's say, America, right? People have similar styles, they all kind of have similar hairstyles and wear similar types of clothing. Um, and I think because of that, I think things spread really quickly. So a good case in point is, I think, cryptocurrency itself. I think um, Korea is a very interesting use, use case because they, they trade, you know, I, I think at one point I read they traded like 30% of the volume of the entire cryptocurrency market, which is insane because Korea is such a small country, relatively speaking. Um, and the other thing that's interesting about Korea is, you know, Koreans are known for, for having a robust gaming industry and having a lot of gamers, right? So I bet all the Koreans here have played a game or two, you know, currently. I don't, I don't know any Koreans that play zero games, right? Um, so that all together makes kind of, you know, Korea a little bit special in terms of cryptocurrency and gaming because they're on the forefront of 
both fields. Yeah, I mean, b given that, that Korea is really on the cutting edge of both, I guess my hypothesis would be that we will see the, the, the intersection of those two happen here first, right? That we'll see some application between virtual currency, video games, and blockchain happening in this market. Um, so, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, you have big game companies and you have the little indies who are producing things. Um, you know, talk about, you know, what is the, the, w what are the concerns that a big game company has in terms of thinking about cryptocurrency? Like what, what are their reservations? Yeah. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I, I'm from NHN Entertainment. We're a publicly listed company in Korea and we're, we're, we're quite old and we're quite big. Uh, and as a public facing company, we just have to be very careful with, uh, things like cryptocurrency because, you know, the regulations always changing. Um, there's a lot of, um, things that are in the gray area at the moment uh, in, in Korea and other geographies. Um, so as a public facing company, I think we're, we're more on the careful side um, and kind of seeing what's going on and being very cautious um, ob for obvious reasons. Whereas a startup, I think, can take much more risk and move a lot faster and take, uh, you know, try it. And if it doesn't work out, they'll, you know, you know switch gears, change direction, be more agile. Um, to me, that's the, I think, the biggest differences, yeah. I mean, completely agree, and therefore, this uh, crypto game is the the opportunity for indie indie developers and all of us. Uh, if you are interested in uh, making a content uh, or games, uh, it's it's a blue ocean. Uh, we need to get on it, and um, you know, it's gonna pay some dividends in the future very soon. So, for the for the indie game developer who is sort of looking at this market, um, what, what do you think they need? Like, what advice would you give an indie developer? Let's say, let's say somebody in here wanted to, like, you know, build a game uh, and maybe participate in this new NFT gold rush. Um, what advice would you give them coming from the gaming industry? I, say I, I would say stay away from it. Uh. <laughs> Uh, if you chase after what's been already popular, you will never actually be the number one. I think, yes, I think there's great excitement, crypto kitties and uh, crypto bots and crypto act and whatever it is. I mean, it, it's already too much. Um, so I think the Korean people are very creative. Um, so I think we got to come up with our own wave of a crypto game. Um, I don't know what form that would be. Uh, certainly, Decentraland uh, provides a new opportunity where uh, non-fungible token is not only a collectible, but it defines the space that you own, and then you can actually create a uh, non-fungible non token that is actually functional. So uh, that's certainly an option. That's why I joined. Um, but I will stay away from uh, what people have already done, and there are st already a lot of players in that field. Uh, but the crypto game, in any form or shape, there's a actually um, a non-fungible token elements to it, and then unique IP is uh, required. So making an exciting game, as always we've done, and then I think uh, it will apply same on the crypto field as well. So I'm, I'm actually a big believer in indie developers. I used to be an indie developer myself. I think a lot of great ideas come from indie development. Uh, in, in terms of like uh, crypto-related games or non-games, uh, revolving or based on non-fungible tokens. I think that's always going to be a super niche in the gaming market as a whole, but I do think it's very interesting. And I think uh, developers that are interested in building something around M NFTs, I think there's a lot more, pot there's like, there's a huge potential. I think if you're just going to look at crypto alpaca and crypto this and that, I think you're not going to get anywhere because like you said, I don't think it's going to last too long. Uh, that's just my personal opinion. Um, but if you look at any new platform, right? So when I was doing gaming like on Facebook, when Facebook games first came out, when they, when they launched their platform, do you remember the apps that were on Facebook? It was like, it was pretty crappy, right? When mobile games first came out, when your iPhone first came out and the app store launched, remember what apps were on your app store? Like fart apps and lighter apps and like you press a button and something happens and everyone's like, whoa, and they made a lot of money, right? I think we're there right now, right? So the, I'm not trying to put down the projects right now, I think. It's, it's just a natural uh, evolution, right? New platform really like 
kind of iffy stuff in the beginning, and then soon after it starts evolving. Like mobile gaming has evolved tremendously. You have like PC, like games that look like PC games on your mobile phone, and it's only been around for less than a decade, right? So imagine, you know, it, it's gonna it's gonna progress a lot further. So when we look at NFTs now, I think, like when we look at crypto kitties and all these, I think we're gonna look at them and be like they were pioneers. But we look at them, we're gonna be gonna laugh at them. We're gonna be like, wow, this was so ghetto. Like we, you know, right, like right. No. like two years from I now, it's gonna you. be yeah. so engaging. We're gonna have like 3D multiplayer games using using NFTs, and it's gonna be like amazing. But you know, for any developers, look two years ahead. Look three years ahead. Don't look at what's built now. If you look what's built now, it's it's not gonna work out. So speaking of like what's coming, uh, you know, AR and VR was the, you know the most talked about category in gaming you know a year or two ago. Uh, T tell, give us an update. Like, what's happening in AR and VR with regards to games? Um, you want the honest version or the AR VR expert version? <laughs> wow. Uh, so uh, give us the public key first. <laughs> then we'll then we'll then we'll get the private it's key. It's still very <laughs> exciting field to be in. I know. Um, I think a lot of uh, guys that who are in the VR um, now, in, especially in Korea, mostly focus on developing. Um, offline experience, meaning uh, you go to like arcade and theme park, uh, that sort of um, uh, content, because that's where you can actually make money right now. Uh, and you know, you could break even or you could sell the content to oversee, so on. So it is still a viable market. Um, and a lot of guys actually now positioning, because it requires the same similar skill sets, positioning on the more of the AR side as well. Uh, in overall, uh, what the enthusiasm that we seen about two years ago on the VR, from the content developer pr perspective, uh, we don't have uh, scalable or uh, sustainable or commercially viable platform. Uh, even if you top in Steam or uh, Oculus stores, um, you know, kind of money you're making is not under your expectation. So um, Decentland, you know, we were a new platform. Um, it's you own your own platform and there's no transaction. Um, you can create the contents of your desires and all the things that the Malcolm mentioned about um, sharing and then uh, selling your non-fungible token is available in that field as well. So um, yeah, sadly speaking, I mean, this is where we are with the VR and AR. Uh, it could have been more exciting. I'm sure, I'm true believers that in five years, or in the future, this is a trend and it will come, uh, but there's a rough road ahead for us. Okay, I'm, I'm not an AR, VR expert. I can only just speak from a consumer standpoint. So, for, so specifically for VR, I think it's always going to be, it's kind of have a, has its niche use case, but in the end, it's, it's ex expensive, it's bulky, uh, there's a lot of friction. Um, and then the experience you get from VR today, uh, with, through, with all that friction, I don't think it's worth the payoff. Uh, so that's why I, I'm not that bullish on VR gaming in the near term. Uh, but once these devices get better, high performing, they get lighter and much cheaper, and we have more development on it, I think it would, ha it would be more interesting. I'm more actually bullish on VR offline experiences versus online experiences. Well, when you say offline experiences, you uh, mean Offline like, like you know, laser tag with VR, you know, like... Oh like like the Void in the U.S., I think th mm -hmm. th those are really cool experiences. I had a great time. But like when I'm playing with my PlayStation VR, like I play for like 30 minutes and then I don't touch it for like three months, personally. Uh, for, for anyone who hasn't experienced, does anyone here know what an offline VR experience is? Oh. Got a few people. So why don't you just talk, explain that? Okay. Um, it's an arcade store. You go in and then actually set the environment where you can actually feel like you're in it. And you could play multi-person play, uh, shooting games. Um, so it's not on your living room condition, but uh, it's much bigger space. Or it could be a room scale, uh, but it creates the bigger like room experience. And often, a lot of times on offlines, there's always a simulator, uh, whether it's uh, like you know simulating the motion of the car or some uh, flying objects. So it actually uh, magnifies that immersive experience with the hardware simulator. Yeah, so I, I mean, I, I've done an experience, you know, sitting on a chair and, you know, as, the ch as like in the VR experience, I'm 
banking to the right, it literally feels like I'm flying. Like I, it feels the energy, you know, like when you're in a roller coaster and you're banking, like you have that experience like in your body or if you're falling, you know, it drops or, you know, it vibrates or, you know, like it's very immersive. Yeah. But those kinds of things you can't do at a consumer level at home. You have to go to a, a you know, place set up for that. Um, all right. Well, let's take some questions from, from folks. Uh, you know, we have like two amazing game experts here. Uh, so, uh, does anyone have some questions? Yeah. Uh, so I was talking with my friend a little bit and he uh, raised a good point. So if you think of it, the blockchain is storing sort of the key to some digital asset, not the asset itself. But if you're storing like a game skin and store on CSGO servers, if CSGO deletes it, then you're kind of just screwed, aren't you? So do you see any way to get around that in the future for games? Yeah, so, uh, you know, when a publisher decides to delete your item, uh, you know, the publisher basically has to live with the wrath of the users. Uh, and you were talking about, like, generally, uh, the players trust the game companies uh, not to do that without a good reason. Uh, and so that's kind of one thing you're sort of stuck with like you know if they delete your account or delete your item like you know you're stuck with it um the only other thing is that nfts as we've been talking about they have limited utility but <laughs> you have 100 percent control so you know the thing that has utility but there's always this risk right it's sort of like the money in your bank account right like you're pretty sure that money's going to be there tomorrow but the bank could decide to take it and you'd have to go fight and figure out how to get it back. So that's always a risk, but it happens so rarely that it's become a tolerable risk. All right, another question for the panels here. All right then. I think we stunned everyone with all this information <laughs> about games. Um, well, I, well, I wanna thank you guys for taking the time to, to participate. I was really illuminating, uh, I, I, I love uh, observing how you, you know, the folks actually making games like see the industry evolving. Um, Decentraland's one of my favorite projects. Um, uh, actually, one of the other things I did want to mention, uh, since since I have you here, we have a, a minute, uh, was really about game game funding. Uh, I think Decentraland had a, one of the most unique funding models. Uh, you know, selling land uh, in a virtual world that hadn't yet been built. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process? Uh, just like you know, what your experience was with it and how you maybe see funding for games evolving? So what's interesting, I mean, I wasn't at the very beginning of part of it, but what's interesting is as um, you know, we raise um, mana, which is our coin, and all of it is actually consumed back by, um, on, on, the, on the land itself. So, um, and it is for the, developers and owners, and we will build the you know, crypto economics on top of it. Um, personally, it, it was some crazy notion that actually, for in the, even on the virtual world, that you need to have ownership. And it's just good that Ari, which is the CEO of our company, have uh, put a stick first on that project. And uh, any other similar kind of concept uh, subsequent to the central end, uh, I will have a great doubt that it will be as successful as the central end because it's a pretty wild idea. Just, just in case uh, you didn't uh, uh, follow exactly how the central end, you know, first evolved, they basically said, "Hey, look, sign up." Uh, I guess it was a, it was a reverse auction process. Yeah, so you could say, hey, look, I want this piece of land. Uh, if you won the auction, you'd then pay for it. Uh, now, let's say you're a landowner, you have the coordinates of it, uh, and then you know, Decentraland said, okay, yeah, we're building out the world. And when the world's built, you'll own that piece of land. So you know, it's a way to raise money. I mean, it's literally, you've put out a concept, people pay you up front for something you deliver later. Uh, and so this represents, I think, uh, a very innovative model for funding. Uh, we've seen virtual items being sold before the game is done. I think 
the scale at which you've done it is is just incredible. Uh, and of course, seventy thousand pieces of land, that's a really large base of supporters. Um, people ask me all the time, like, well, why why is blockchain so interesting and cryptocurrency so interesting? And I'd say it's really because it's the best funding, the most efficient funding mechanism ever invented. I mean, typically you have to pay thousands of people to go out and advertise for you, to market for you, to say how great you are. Uh, cryptocurrency is the reverse where they pay you to do that, right? I mean, like you go buy an EOS token and now you're like, EOS is the best thing since sliced bread, you know? Uh, you paid EOS for the right to be able to advertise and market, you know, what they're doing. So, you know, in a way, if you're interested in a game and you buy an asset in the game, you want to see that game successful. Um, and that's a powerful shift uh, where the crowd can really make something. It's like a, it's like a crowd funder on steroids. So, do you have? Oh, so one of the things that we're building um, at NHN is um, we're building a gaming ecosystem. And then one of the one of the services that we're building, because you're mentioning it, is we're actually building a Kickstarter for game development using staking tokens. Uh, so you can stake our, our native token, which then supports the development of games in development from mostly indie game developers. And if the, fund is, if the fundraise is successful, then that game would come to fruition and you would get rewarded with in-game items and these type of things. So it's kind of like you said how you know crypto is like, one of uh, an interesting way to raise money, but we're using that and building that on top of another model like Kickstarter that's also been proven to fund game development. So, so, so let me get this straight. You have like a two level fundraising mechanism, like where they can stake a token, but then they can also back a project. So, they stake, so, in, in, kick, so in Kickstarter, you guys probably know is you, you, you post a project, you have a fundraising target, you raise money. If it hits that, target raised and you get the rewards that are given to you by the person that posted the project. So instead of using cash, we use our, our token. And then that game uh, is allowed to be published on our platform, uh, our portal, which is something else that we're building uh, using the same currency, the, the token. Wow, okay. Uh, that's pretty awesome. Um, and are you, you driving the blockchain project there? Or is uh, yeah, we, we have a team. One of my teammates is right here, uh, but we have a <laughs> okay. But I'm, 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 I'm more of the outreaching stage. Got it. And Got it. More of like the product manager development. Fantastic. Um, and, and would you say that like this sort of, I mean, one, I think it's a very innovative model. Uh, so I'm happy to hear a, a large company like NHN like really leaning into that. Um, how would you say the rest of the industry is here in Korea relative? I mean, are, are you think they're being as bold or are they more timid or? I <laughs> I can't say I know for certain because I haven't really talked to every game large game company here in Korea about blockchain projects. I do know I do know for a fact that everyone's has thought about it, right, and thinking about what to do with it and how we could use it. Yeah. Um, even internally, we've always, we've we've been discussing for months. Like, okay, we're very interested in blockchain. We see it as a, an opportunity, right? Um, but we don't know exactly how to use it. That was our conversation la early last year. Um, how do we utilize this, right? Do we want to build something decentralized? or much something more centralized or something in the middle, a hybrid approach, what are the pros and cons? And after uh, mulling over for many, many months, you know, I think we came up with an interesting model. Um, but I think to answer your question, other companies, uh, specifically some of the big ones we've talked to, and um, I do know for a fact they do, they have interest in it, but um, from my understanding, most of them don't have internal projects at this point. Yeah, or at least announced any projects that I know of. Um, just comment a little bit. So probably the first year uh, company like NHN and the next one and so on, are the much bigger companies that have their own project, they're thinking about it or they've been investigating for a long time. Um, we, we're gonna soon announce uh, probably second and third year partner, uh, com Korean game company partnership with the Decentraland. Uh, because it's a perfect match. Uh, they've been thinking about it, but they haven't really decided what to do. But Decentraland kind of provide a um, kind of a pilot run and then get a bit of a taste on what's like to do uh, crypto games. So 
you know, we will make some announcements soon, but uh, you know, we can play that role as well in that field. Great, great. Well, I'm, I, I think uh, what, what you're doing here and NHN is doing here, I think is some of the most innovative things I've heard of in the larger um, gaming industry. Uh, there are a lot of conversations, but uh, I think people are still evaluating um, overall. Um, you know, Blizzard, uh, EA, uh, you know, um, Riot and Tencent. Now, I, I actually, there was this great project I saw recently. Tencent launched uh, a AR, like Pokemon Go meets CryptoKitties, where you would use your phone, you'd go around, you would, and you'd be able to collect items. Um, I think it's called Let's Hunt Monsters. Um, and it's on their own chain, uh, so it's their own private private chain uh, and you can collect items. So I'm very curious to see how that project goes um, because I think it sort of captures two really interesting ideas at the same time. Um, Pokemon Go is still I think one of the top five uh, grossing apps for, for games. It's in the, is there maybe top ten. Mobile yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's top five mobile. Um, Fortnite obviously. <laughs> <laughs> being number one, so um, well, cool. So I think I think we're good. Uh, I think we're, we're uh, let's thank our panelists. So thanks for coming, guys.